Awesome. All right, everyone. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the webinar. My name is Jeff Parcher. I'm the Communication Director of the Center for Community Change. We are very excited to share this uh, research with you all. From the looks of the turnout, it seems that people uh, all over the country who work on addressing these issues, which we uh, pre previously called poverty and inequality, but that our research suggests some alternative frameworks for, are really still thirsty for new insights about language that people can really see themselves in. If you don't know CCC well, I just want to say that we were founded in 1968 as the Living Memorial to Robert F. Kennedy to carry out his vision that change can only come when low-income people themselves, particularly people of color, are empowered in the conversation about the issues that impact their lives, both at the community level and all the way to the national level. That's what we do, and that's why we undertook this research so robustly and so differently, and we'll get into that in a few minutes, than the others who have approached these issues from a messaging research standpoint. Today, our lead researchers will present the new findings. They will be referencing a four-page summary that you should have been emailed a link to this morning. That summary is available at www.puttingfamiliesfirst.org. Uh, if you did not receive it, it is there. At the end, we will be taking and answering your questions. You are all muted, so if you have questions, please type them in the box uh, listed as questions, which is in the bottom right of your screen. Uh, we will track those questions throughout, and we will get to the question uh, section. I will queue the questions up for our researchers. Uh, one last thing. Uh, you may need to turn up the volume on your system when we get to playing the actual uh, dial testing uh, messages. The, the volume on those uh, actual slides is built in, and you will hear the actual uh, audio that the persons who took uh, our survey heard. So just be uh, conscious of the fact that you're, you may need to turn your volume up there. Uh, now I'd like to hand it over to Anat Shankar Osario. Anat is a brilliant cognitive linguist that is quickly revolutionizing the progressive movement's whole approach to thinking about researching message issues, messaging issues. She, she's helping us all focus on persuasion and real, real movement building in our work. And Celinda Lake is, of course, one of the leading pol uh, pollsters and political strategists in America, and she's the only member of that class who really, really follows where the data goes. She doesn't tell us all what we want to hear, and she's helping us every day challenge the conventional wisdom about how to talk about these issues, which we can be uh, which can be so, so wrong, and we will get into that in a moment. But, Anat, let's begin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, and thanks to everyone at CCC who made this research possible, who de demonstrated such incredible commitment in time and resources to really doing this work um, and doing it well and not shying away from the harder answers. Um, really excited and proud uh, to just get to be sort of the voice behind the work of so many people, um, including my co-presenter here, Celinda, who uh, both Celinda and her colleagues, uh, especially I want to point out Jonathan Voss at Lake Research Partners, um, just a joy to work with, a pleasure, smart, committed, uh, fun, funny, it's been um, a really amazing project. And for those of you who know me, you know that I do not go blowing sunshine up anybody's anywhere, uh, just willy-nilly. So if I say that they're awesome, I actually mean it. So with that, let's get to what you're all here for, which is the research. Um, there we go. So good news. Uh, Celinda and I, separately and together, don't often get to give good news, especially to large and important groups of people such as yourselves, and so we're incredibly happy to be able to do so. Um, we have messages that are not only powerfully giving voice to the set of ideas that all of us on this call really, really know that we need to be advancing and that are long overdue in the public discourse, but we have messages that are beating the conventional approach to talking about issues of poverty, economic inequality, job creation, that dreaded word government, all the things that we're supposedly never allowed to say. Um, as you will soon see, you can in fact say them if you pay attention 
to how it is you're constructing your arguments. Um, questions, I'm sorry, messages that overtly mention race that detail the gender-based component of economic hardship. All of these things that supposedly make messages impossible to hear, in fact, not true, as I'm sure many of you on this call have long suspected and been saying in your own ways. And so with that, I'm going to start us off with Celinda. Um, the one other thing that I want to say at the top is that the governing principle of this research, and hopefully it will shine through as you're seeing the results, is that it's not the job of a good message to say what is popular. That is a relatively easy task that is beneath us. It is the job of a good message to make popular what we need said. What we need said is our fixed point, and if any comms person tells you, well, you just can't say that, my suggestion to you is you find a comms person who helps you say what you need to say, because that's not what ought to be changing. So, Linda. Thank you. And I want to add my thanks and um, say it is an unbelievable uh, revolution on our side, really, to be able to work with Anant and uh, to really understand why language works the way it does, how it connects to uh, schemas that people have in their heads so that we can be much more persuasive. I want to thank CCC and all of you all on the call for your courage, your commitment, and your contribution. Um, and it is great to be able to be part of a project that says if the activists don't believe in the message, that message is dead on arrival, that we're going to find messages that the activists believe in. And, and some of you may have even participated in the dial surveys that work with our base, that work with our persuadable voters, and that alienate the opposition. This messaging project is very, very different from other messaging projects where we have, uh, I often say to Jeff laughingly, who, by the way, is just an amazing leader, uh, along with Deepak and Mary and all the other folks at um, CCC, uh, but an amazing uh, communications director. And the uh, if we had a nickel for every project we participated in where we say, well, we get 50% of the opposition, so we consider that, or 60%, 70%, we consider that a good message. And as a not, we'll talk about later, that actually ought to be a warning that there's something fundamentally flawed with the message. And I'll leave uh, that as a, just a taster for uh, what Anat will get into. But in these messages, we judged our messages by how much we isolated the opposition. That's what the right wing does. They don't say, gosh, we got half the communists and half the liberals, so we're excited about our message. Uh, they say we've isolated uh, the progressives and uh, we're persuading the middle and energizing our base. And that, in the long run, is what makes for a powerful social movement, as well as winning short-term campaigns, both politically and legislatively. Um, so the first message that we tested, uh, you will see here the moment-to-moment -moment reactions of voters uh, in our base, in the opposition, and in the persuadables. And these groups are defined by their core values. And in fact, these messages start not with facts, not with statistics, not with policies, but with people's core values and lived experience. And we'll talk about why that works. So you'll be watching the base, which is the blue line, uh, who are the people that really agree with us on values, the opposition, which is the people who really fundamentally disagree with us on values. And these people are defined not by partisanship or something like that, although they tend to be disproportionately older white men and Republicans, but um, they are defined by their attitudes. And then the people that are persuadable, the people in the middle. And watch also the activists, which is the orange line. So our top testing message that also soundly beat the opposition's message um, brought over to our side some core values that very often we leave too much to the right. It was also a message that explicitly mentioned race and gender. CCC, as, as um, Anat said, gave the explicit instructions. This is not an issue where we want to hide the ball. This is not a campaign where we don't want to say government. We don't want to say 
um, investment, we don't want to say racial and gender discrimination. We want to find message approaches that uh, successfully incorporate all of those elements. And what was very exciting about this research is that um, after much work with interviews and focus groups and then the dials, we were indeed able to find ways to successfully refer to what we care about. So let's listen to the first message, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's working in this message and what's not. You wouldn't know it from politicians, but Americans stand largely united. We work for our families. We pitch in for our communities, and we believe in America. We want to leave things better for our children. To get there, we have to create good, stable jobs for anyone willing to work that provide benefits and pay you can sustain a family on, and end racial and gender discrimination. We believe everyone means everyone, no exceptions. So what's uh, very, very interesting about this message is notice the two places where the red line goes down, the opposition goes down, is when we explicitly refer to uh, working parents and also to racial and gender discrimination, and they're really alienated by everyone means everyone. Meanwhile, the base and our activists are dialing continually up on that and, in fact, searching on the explicit mention of race and gender and the explicit mention of everyone means everyone, which, by the way, came from um, millennials in the focus groups that we were testing uh, when they said, why are you always dividing people into groups? Why can't everyone just mean everyone? And notice also the persuadables are not dialing down. They're moving up and on this sense of shared values. So those are the unconscious ratings, the dial lines. So what you see on this chart, the next chart, is the conscious ratings. At the end, we ask people, okay, how convincing do you find this message overall? And often the unconscious ratings are different than the conscious ratings. Uh, so consciously we know both the base and the persuadables found this message um, very, very persuadable, uh, very, very persuasive. The persuadables remember it a little less convincing, although this is uh, how many people rated 100 and how many people rated 80 to 100 uh, on a scale from 0 to 100. Um, and, but we find that the opposition remembers the message even less persuasive than they had actually found it. The good things about this message is that it, these messages are all in service of a bold, explicit agenda. And what is good about this message is it wasn't just the rhetoric that got people to dial up. People responded to the explicit statement of the bold agenda, creating good, stable jobs, which alienated the opposition. The second um, thing that was good about it is our ability to explicitly mention racial and gender discrimination. And over a variety of work that we've done with or not on different aspects of racism and sexism, we find invariably that when we establish um, common values and common lived experience, then we can very explicitly mention race, gender, and the things that we care about. This message has a little bit of a slow takeoff. Uh, we're in a nine-second soundbite world, so we like it when messages jump a little faster. It also has relatively lower intensity, and we don't alienate the opposition as much as we would like. But this is a top-testing message, brings back to our side for a change some of the core values that so many of us believe in, and uh, but often hesitate to incorporate in our messaging. It explicitly mentions race and gender, and it beats every other message out there, uh, which conventional wisdom would say is impossible. So let's look at the second strong testing message, which is also in the top, also beat all of the opposition messages. They may drive you crazy, but everyone knows family comes first. Providing for your family and being there when they need you isn't negotiable. Every working parent should get paid enough to care for their kids and set them off toward a great future. If politicians want to talk family values, it's time they start valuing families. And that means making sure all Americans have a job that allows them to make ends meet. So as you can see, this message starts to take off faster. 
It also unites the activists, the base, and the persuadables, and it alienates the opposition sooner. Um, one of the things that alienates the opposition, and we found this in a variety of projects that we've done with Anat, including some on work and family policies, is when we say every working parent, these opposition who are really the right-wing opposition against us, they don't want women to work outside the home. They don't like explicit mentions or things that are inclusive of, of gender. And every time we've tested something like it, who knew that calling on something for every working parent uh, would be perceived negatively? Uh, but it is, and it's a place where we can really draw a distinction between our opposition and ourselves. Um, this is rated consciously very high by the base and the activists, even more so than the initial message. And the persuadables also give this a very high conscious rating. So it's doing very well, both consciously and unconsciously. The one place that falls a little short is our call here to action, which is making sure all Americans have a job. The persuadables are fine with it. It isn't that they dislike it, but they don't dial up on it. And it turns out that it is better to have a little bit more proactive and descriptive uh, uh, kind of language. Create good and stable jobs than saying make sure all Americans have a job, which sounds a little passive. Uh, and what kind of jobs are we talking about? Uh, and people are very, very worried now by not just whether you have jobs, but what are the quality of those jobs. So let's look at the next message. America has swung out of balance. Our work creates record wealth, but profits don't get to the people clocking in and out to produce them. Our economic rules unfairly favor the rich because they are written by politicians beholden to wealthy special interests. No one lobbies for average Americans. Everyone who works should make ends meet, have a say about their futures, and everyone who wants to work should be guaranteed a decent job with benefits. So there are a couple of things about this that are great about this message. First of all, the messages that work the best articulate about two-thirds solution to one-third problem. But when we articulate the problem on our side, we often articulate it in a way that is not powerful to people. And uh, I think Anat will talk about why, uh, but if we had one piece of advice to give you out of this research, it is purge forever from your dialogues the language of GAP. Uh, GAP does not test well. It divides people. It um, makes people feel like they're falling through the gap. It seems like it just happens rather than being created. The strongest language, and this came out of original work that Anat did, and I would strongly recommend that everyone on this call buy her book and I don't get a commission. It's called Don't Buy It, But uh, Do Buy It. Um, and it talks about how the strongest way to talk about the economy is out of balance. And actually people in our focus groups use that language a lot. That is how they personally describe what's going on. It's out of balance. And if something is out of balance, it's created in such a way that it's out of balance, we can put it back in balance. We can take action to put it back in balance for all of us. This message has very, very strong conscious and unconscious ratings. It alienates the opposition very quickly, uh, talking about working people guaranteed a decent job with benefits. Everyone who works should make ends meet. The opposition hates all of that language. Who knew that such a basic platform that is so wildly popular with the public would be seen as communism uh, by the opposition? Um, the one place that it is falling a little short is that people actually remember it less strongly than they actually dial it at the moment. And part of that may probably be because um, of a couple things. One, it hits the politicians. And hitting the politicians right now is always strong with the public. And two, it this one uh, revolves a little bit more around what the problem is, a little bit higher ratio of problem to solution. And the best testing messages actually refer to the solution a little bit more than the problem. That said, when we want to talk about the problem, we want to talk about an economy that's been created that is out of balance. 
and we can create a different one. And we want to talk and paint a picture of people's real lived experience. People clocking in, people working for their families, people taking care of their family even when it drives them crazy. There's lots of language in these messages that really relates to how real people picture themselves and think about their real lived experience. So let's turn to the next message. Our country's strength is grounded in our ability to work together. You and I know our society is at its best when we grant every provider the opportunity to pursue their dreams. And that means we need to create good jobs. America succeeds when everyone is paid enough to care for his or her family, when every entrepreneur has the tools to make their vision a reality, and when every American can retire in dignity. So the reason we like this message and we showed it to you, it's also stronger than the opposition message and one of our stronger messages. Much of it's covered in other things, but there are two things about this message that are really powerful to notice. First of all, what are we going to call ourselves? Um, and what we found repeatedly is working people, family members, and providers uh, was the strongest language in terms of what to call ourselves. Secondly, this message is quite strong because it is bringing in um, the entrepreneur, the small business person. And that's important because we can't cede that terrain uh, to the other side. They tend to use the entrepreneur, speak on behalf of the small business person, which is very, very powerful to people. And we need to make sure that we include that too because people are protective of entrepreneurs, protective of small businesses. We can't cede that whole terrain in our economic messaging. This message is also quite powerful to people because it brings people together. Uh, America really has a yearning to come together. And America also believes that any three Americans can agree on more than Congress or their state legislature does. Um, so this language of ability to work together, really, really strong for the persuadable voters. Notice also, we've done away with all the passive language here. This language is action-oriented, grant, paid enough, create. And as you go through your websites, go through your messaging, you want to use action-oriented verbs, not passive verbs. Action-oriented verbs mobilize people. They say that this is something that people can change. If this was created, it can be created in a different way. And uh, it makes people feel much more inspired to action. This has a relatively slow, a little bit slower start with our base. And um, the opposition is weaker in its alienation. But I think rather than particularly adopting this message, we need to take the components of this message that are really powerful, like the entrepreneur language, like the working together, and the, the general philosophy of action-oriented verbs. And last, uh, we'll show you our last strong testing message. America is a nation of strivers. People working hard to make ends meet, offer their children a better future, and support their elders. America has come through tough times before, and we can do it again. We can improve our jobs by guaranteeing good wages and benefits, while also creating new jobs that sustain our families by meeting America's needs for infrastructure, education, child care, and a better future. So there are a couple of things about this message. Um, we tested this message for two reasons. Um, because we wanted to have a message that was even more explicit in its agenda setting and its call to action. And we did two variations of this message. One, the one that you heard, talking about child care, talking about education. And we did another version that substituted energy in there. The version that talked about education, child care, was stronger overall than the message that talked about energy. Now, energy was quite strong with our base and actually very alienating uh, to the opposition. Uh, but for the persuadable voters, it was uh, slightly stronger to talk about um, uh, the uh, caring education and child care agenda. That was particularly true when we were talking to women. Uh, rather than the clean energy agenda. 
The things that dialed up here that people responded to quite quickly, people working hard to make ends meet. Uh, the agenda tested very strongly, guaranteeing good wages and benefits, and actually alienated the opposition while moving the base and the persuadables. Again, what's really interesting here is how quickly we can marginalize our opposition by just being action-oriented on behalf of our agenda. The persuadables do uh, plateau out a little bit. And this does have a little bit weaker conscious ratings and unconscious ratings, but it does show how we can attach our messages to a very explicit call for policy and for action. So if those are the messages, let me turn it over to Anat to talk about what words worked and what didn't and why these messages worked the way they did. Thank you. Thank you, Celinda. Um, so first, let me just... Uh, sort of do a real quick recap of what uh, we're going to call the pillars of a good message sort of globally. The first, and Celinda did a great job summarizing uh, most of this, is that a good message avoids the passive voice. It makes it clear that the problems have a source. We do not anymore say things like the wage grab gap is growing, the ranks of poverty are swelling, hardship is continuing. Because what that does is it obscures from view the very real decisions that people make in order to create these conditions. So the first thing a good message does is it sources problems. The second thing a good message does is it avoids abstract concepts. So as I sometimes like to tell people, inequality is far too important a problem to talk about using useless words like inequality. Basically, if you can't imagine drawing a picture of it, if it doesn't have a weight or a shape or a smell or some sort of tangible quality, then people can't really grasp it in any kind of meaningful way. And so instead of saying, for example, inequality, what we say is the rich hoarding too much wealth in too few hands or an economy out of balance or people deliberately rigging the rules in their favor. Um, the third thing that an effective message does, and this is the place we really need a lot of, uh, to exercise our message muscle, if you will, is that it messages outcome, not policy. As a dear friend and frequent collaborator, Ryan Clayton sometimes likes to say, uh, don't take your policy out in public, it's unseemly. We are big fans of talking about the means to get to our objective. And so we like to talk about, for example, raising the minimum wage or implementing a paid leave policy or creating a form of government-sponsored work or making the government the employer of last resort. Those are all great things and it's fine for us to talk about them amongst ourselves, but what the public actually is moved and motivated by, what brings them either over to our side or if they're already on our side, gets them excited, uh, and want them repeating our tropes is to message the outcomes. So even something as simple as raise the minimum wage, which is a policy, when restated as people are paid enough to provide for family, people are much more enthusiastic about it. When we move from something like implement sick days to all people can stay home to recover from illness and injury, that's messaging the outcome. So we want to move towards that. The fourth pillar of a good message is, as you hopefully noticed from our messages, they begin with a value proposition. And they, draw, they use that value proposition to drive to the set of solutions that we want. What we find is that a set of solutions that are packaged within a value proposition are always going to be more popular than a list of policies, which to us are clearly connected, but to most people just sound like a laundry list. And then finally, the last pillar of a good message is a recognition that populism absolutely has its place and it's good. And as we saw both from these results and earlier results, there's basically nothing better that you can say if you want to make a lot of people really, really excited and agree with you than anything nasty you can think of about CEOs. That's definitely going to get you some points. But we need to be mindful of the fact that populism is a double-edged sword. If we wander too far into the realm of the economy is broken, the rules are rigged, 
everything has gone to shit and hell in a handbasket, then basically what we do is we risk suppressing people's will to action. Because if things have been taken to that ultimate sort of precipice and we're already in fact barreling over the edge, then the correct reaction from the public is, okay, well, I might as well just watch the demise of the world in the U.S. economy in high definition from some comfy couch. That's why we believe that the balance metaphor that Celinda referenced is working so effectively, because it both taps into people's real lived sense of the problem, but it doesn't suggest that this is sort of beyond any kind of human hope or human ability to alter. The next thing that I want to sort of highlight is there are many places where the devil is very much in the details on wording. So, for example, we did a bunch of different wording tests beyond just the messages that you saw, and we found that the same phrase in support of our policies when voiced as um, people are paid enough to sustain a family versus people are paid enough to raise a family, sustain is beating out raised by wide margins. And the reason for that is most likely that raise suggests a very specific kind of family structure. It suggests people with children, probably young children, still in the formative years. Sustain casts a much wider net. It allows for a family in which perhaps people don't have children or perhaps people have children already out of the house and they're in that sandwich generation caring for elders. It's just a much broader notion of what the money is going to pay for as we are, in, again, attempting to message outcomes, not policies. Um, we tried in many different permutations the notion of guaranteeing good jobs versus ensuring good jobs. Insuring is coming out slightly ahead of guarantee, but it, they're both still problematic, which is why CCC and the entire coalition has gone with the very clean and simple good jobs for all. In some ways, you could say that's because people are sort of loath to think of some kind of um, pre-manufactured guarantee or entitlement. But in fact, part of what's going on here is actually um, a sign of good hope in that what guarantee and insure does is it eclipses the origin story of jobs. Jobs don't come from the magical jobs fairy, as everybody on this call knows. Um, jobs come from the human activity of most people, whether that's production or consumption, saving, investment, just basically the living of lives is what creates most jobs, contrary to the mythology of the wealthy and their magical job creation ones. And so when we say guarantee good jobs or ensure good jobs, what that does is it doesn't suggest that there's actually sort of a virtuous cycle of where jobs come from and that's sort of positive human activity. The last sort of devil in the details I would um, call out is that in wanting to really put these messages through the ringer, we held them to what we like to think of as high bars. And by that I mean we checked that these messages not only were popular at the moment of dialing and in the conscious ratings after the fact that Celinda shared with us, but also that they actually moved people on core issues, which we asked about at the beginning of the end. And the end. And one of those core issues was a $15 an hour minimum wage. Now, as probably all of you know, had we asked at the beginning and at the end about support for a minimum wage increase, I don't really think we could say anything about the value of our messages in that respect because Americans are largely on board with a minimum wage increase. So to say that people supported that by the end of our messages is a little bit of a ridiculous credit to take. So instead what we did is we tested a number of high bars, harder things that people generally don't agree with, like overt mentions of race, overt mentions of gender, a $15 an hour minimum wage. And no matter what people will tell you about the inability to get people on board with that idea, um, in fact, we know both from what's actually happening, thanks to folks on this call who are busting their asses organizing on the ground, um, when we talk about a $15 an hour minimum wage increase, and we use the magical phrase phase in, which is in fact the policy option that's on the table in most of the cities that are considering this, and we talk about keeping pace with the cost of living. Notice not the jargon of adjusted for inflation, 
um, then people are absolutely with us. Next thing that I want to mention um, is race. Uh, you saw Celinda touch on and lead off with a message where we have overt mention of both racial and gender discrimination. We tried different evocations of race in multiple different points of this text, and I don't think it's going to surprise anybody on this call to hear that um, we've got a long way to go. Um, we have found ways that we can sort of use this language that we want to be able to use because it's accurate to the lived experience and the reality of our country. But I'd be lying to you if I said, you know, it's a slam dunk every value we tested about the nature of poverty being closely tied to race and people being really with us. Um, I hope you would know I was lying if I told you that that sort of garners overwhelming approval. But the issue that I really want to raise for you, because I think it's a challenge that we need to wrestle with as sort of a progressive messaging community, is that one of the other experiments that we ran in this data was we gave people the opportunity in multiple different permutations to self-label. And one of the labels that we were really looking closely at was the selection of person of color. And Regardless of how we use the phrase people of color or person of color within our own activist circles and how much we believe it to sort of be an effective blanket term, Latinos in our sample are rejecting this terminology. They are not self-considering people of color, and we see in that measure and multiple other measures that when we're using the language of person of color, communities of color, people of color, they believe that that's a reference to African Americans. So what that means for us is either that this is an education challenge and that we actually need to do the work of making this um, term mean what it is we desire it to mean, or we need to be cognizant of the fact that even if there are um, Asian American Pacific Islander activists and Latino activists within our circles who very readily identify under the banner of person of color, we can't believe, we can't sort of take, in it as give, take, in, take it as given that the public is hearing what it is we mean with that label and identifying and knowing, oh, you mean me. Finally, getting into those devilly details, um, let's look at some uh, replace, embrace. And Jeff referenced at the top of the call that you all have handouts, so you know, don't worry about kind of scribbling this all down. Um, you, you absolutely will have it provided to you in a, in a easy to use format. So instead of talking about a set of policies or even individual policies, we're going to banish the word policy itself. It does not work very well and talk about changing the rules or a different set of rules. Instead of casting aside the real actions and activities and contributions of the communities that are most affected by economic hardship, like with words like marginalized or underserved or poor communities, um, we are going to talk about what it is people are actually doing, which is struggling to make ends meet or can't get ahead no matter how hard we try, and really put the lens of agency on the people. Um, instead of, again, naming policy, increase the minimum wage, and adequate wage, we're going to talk about what that policy achieves, which is paid enough to sustain family, provide for those you love. Instead of saying that some group earns less than another, whether that be women and men, African Americans and whites, Latinos and whites, and so on and so forth, that is in fact not true. Uh, women earn exactly as much as men. In other words, the value of our labor per hour is the same. Otherwise, we don't have an argument to make. They are paid less, which is an outside decision that is made by somebody with the authority to choose how much to pay people. Those words are not synonymous. We're going to banish GAP from our vocabulary. It does not tell an origin story. It simply tells us that there is some sort of economic or health or educational division. And when we don't fill in an origin story, people are just as likely to fill one in for themselves. And the story they like to tell is, of course, some people are rich and some people are poor. Some people are awesome and work really hard, and some people are lazy and less equipped to succeed. So instead, we are going to situate the lens squarely on the people making decisions. 
um, instead of going to a lowest common denominator argument about we can't survive and low pay is not okay, which is a wonderful and perfectly apt rallying cry at the minimum wage, but let's face it, people way above the minimum wage, people who have been paid 30 and 40 and even arguably 50 or $60,000 for the last few decades with no raise in sight despite unbelievable, unprecedented productivity. We're not going to be able to get a wage hike across the board if we just keep talking about it as a matter of basic decency at the very lowest levels. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to remind people that the money to pay working people comes from their work. And asking for a raise is not asking for magical additional money from the nice boss man or woman's pocket. The money to pay people comes from their own work. Uh, I talked earlier about the difference between raise and sustain. Um, we find also then when we talk about what we should do or what government should do or what a politician should do, people get very reactive and say to us, yeah, well, they should do that, but government sucks. They should do that, but all they care about is their lobbyists. And it just sends them off into an unhelpful spiral of, um, government bashing, which we know is very top of mind, understandably. When instead we talk about we can do this, it doesn't send them as much in that direction, and it once again activates that notion of desire for change and action. Um, I talked before about GAP not being useful. Uh, you'll see lots and lots of things on my replace side that are basically an attempt in many different ways to get rid of the passive voice. I it, these are not repetitions accidentally. There is so much passive voice in progressive language that I could probably make 430 slides that were just examples of the passive voice that I would like to eliminate. We're no longer going to talk about something being good for the economy. Um, one of the most striking things about these messages is not so much what they have, but what they lack. In none of them is an argument that doing X, Y, or Z is good for the economy or is going to grow GDP. As we know from ourselves and from our fellow advocates, when you ask people, why do you do this work? I have personally never had the experience of one of you saying to me, I'm just passionate about the GDP. I just get out of bed in the morning and I think, man, what's the economy like? Their brand is good for the economy. Their brand is loving numbers and GDP sizes. Our brand is people. And the argument that we want to be having is what is good for the nation and what is good for Americans and what is good for everyone, because that's a brand we own, and it's actually a brand that people prefer. We're going to move away from abstraction. Again, we're going to move from the gap in inequality to balance. Um, we're not going to talk about conditions persisting or some group experiencing. We're going to talk about deliberate choices because when we talk about deliberate choices, we make it clear that we could make other choices. And then finally, um, we're going to talk about what our policies allow us to accomplish, make ends meet, set kids off to a bright future, and borrow the language that we got from the millennials. Everyone means everyone. And I know and I want to sort of call out that this last replace embrace is a challenge. And it's a challenge that um, I would like to be presenting differently. But you know, part of the job here is actually to tell you guys the truth. Uh, we can absolutely call out overt discrimination, but we need to call it out while also balancing people's desire for an everyone means everyone and community and come together kind of message. So with that, uh, I will turn it back to Jeff to moderate Q&A. Thank you, Anand and Salinda. So we are now to the question and answer uh, section of the webinar. I will remind everybody that there is a question box um, in your uh, on the bottom right of your screen. So type your question in, and we will try to get to it. I have a number of questions um, already available. And one last thing before we get to the first question that I have here. I want to remind everybody, or not remind them, let you know that we have taped today's webinar. We will be sending a link uh, to everyone that RSVP'd that you should feel free to share and use in any of your uh, work. We will also make that link available um, on the website. So um, let's get to questions. The, the first question is, uh, what about other versions of GAP language? And the specific example the questioner would like to know about is, uh, what about talking in education about the achievement gap? 
And I, you want to start with that one? Yeah. Don't do it. Um, it has the exact same problems. We've tested in multiple different projects the achievement gap in the health um, in the health realm, uh, health disparity, which is just basically like the Harvard of gaps. Uh, Any time we talk about horizontal separation, sort of thing X is apart from thing Y, all that tells us is the existence of separation. It doesn't tell us why that separation came about. And as I said, when you don't tell people an origin story, they fill one in for themselves. And the default is simple causation. The default is that it lies within the individual. Um, it does not, the default is not, it lies within the systemic differences. So besides imbalance, which of course works really neatly in the economic space, the other metaphor that is sort of the flip side of the gap coin that we see a lot of traction and efficacy around is the barrier. So a barrier in some ways is also just a way to talk about um, horizontal division, horizontal distance, but what it does is it profiles and it sort of foregrounds the reason for the separation. It doesn't foreground the fact of separation. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions here about race. It seems that um, uh, the listeners are hearing us loud and clear that communities of color did not perform as well as we had hoped. The question is, what language should we be using on race and gender, and specifically the question is should we name um, and when should we name specific demographic groups, i.e. African Americans, Latinos, etc., um, or should we stick to this everyone needs everyone frame? Celinda, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Why don't you start and I'll jump in. Okay. So an interesting phenomenon that's happening around the communities of color, um, and this is a complicated point, so I'll try to make it clearly and <laughs> hopefully succeed. Uh, when we ask questions around, you know, should government make uh, significant investments uh, to guarantee good jobs in areas of, and I'm saying this very carefully, in areas of high unemployment and low wages, we got a lot of traction around that. When we split sampled that with the phrase in, including communities of color, um, we actually lost African Americans. And the reason we believe that we lost them, that that was a less popular formulation, um, is because they were hearing areas of high unemployment and low wages as meaning communities of color. And so then when we expressly said including communities of color, it sort of called into question, oh, well, what did you mean before? Did you mean everywhere before and now we're only going to get some piece of it? So that is one part of the answer. It is an admittedly insufficient um, question, it is insufficient part of the answer, but the dynamics are really complicated. I mean, I'm deliberately telling you we lost African Americans when we specifically called that out. Um, we lose Latinos when we use people of color, communities of color, as opposed to African Americans and Latinos. Um, so partly the answer is it's a little bit context dependent. It's hard to sort of apply a blanket answer, but some of the time the answer is to actually name the communities themselves and until we do the work of, you know, making people of color, communities of color, if this is what we desire as a sort of communication community, until we do the work of having people understand what it is we mean by that label and that, yes, we mean you too, um, then we need to actually name the groups, uh, name them out, and we don't have sort of a, a banner name for them. Um, you can do both and, and by that I mean, areas of highest unemployment um, and lowest wages, or especially in the places that uh, have been long, hardest hit and longest ignored, like among African Americans and Latinos, um, because of course in America everyone means everyone. Making the explicit and then making the reason for the explicit ask be because everyone means everyone. Because what's embedded in that assumption is that up until now, everyone has not meant everyone. 
Yeah, the only other things I would add are um, in terms of explicitly mentioning groups, um, you know, I mean, Asian American Pacific Islanders, for example, are one of the biggest rising groups, um, and, you know, we often don't include them. Native Americans often not included. So the problem with the list is the list gets longer and longer and longer. And the more we get longer, the more we're seeming to divide people by categories and not be in the mood for everyone. And other language, I think some of the best besides everyone means everyone, and the point that are not made of describing situations, like particularly including areas of high unemployment and low income. The other thing in the education world that has worked very well is that every child in America ought to be guaranteed a good education no matter what zip code they live in or no matter what zip code they're born in. And um, that kind of language that seems more inclusive is really testing significantly better right now. We tested after the last election even the language of um, even when it came to gender, you know, when women do well, America does well, and or when women succeed, America succeeds. And, you know, it among blue-collar white women, it actually tested remarkably poorly. And people said things like, well, you know, I need my husband to do well too because he makes more money than I do. And another person said, well, I have a daughter, but I have a son too, and I'm worried about jobs for both of them. And it was actually a millennial who said, well, why can't everyone just be everyone? Why can't we all do well? Um, so everyone in America is feeling, uh, or almost everyone in America is feeling um, under pressure, stuck, harmed by this last recession. And there's definitely an acknowledgement that there need to be, that, you know, not everyone's experience was the same, that there are certainly people that are having it much harder now and had it much harder. But in general, it just works better, these things that are unifying, that are, you know, the language of gap, the language of specific groups, the language of singling out a group. It's just not working that well. Sometimes even with the groups that we intend to be advancing with that singling out. Great. Uh, there are a number of questions here about uh, alienating the opposition and people wanting to know a little bit more about why that is a good principle for the methodology. So I, I, I think it would be good for you to start off um, and talk a little bit about who we're talking about when we say the opposition in this research so people have a good picture of that. And then secondly, dive into a little bit what are the dangers of having a message that strongly appeals to your opposition and what are the benefits of having a message that makes them, uh, you know, dial down. Do you want, so do you one thing that we do you to are dealing with, the opposition here is defined by, I'll, I'll tell you who they are and then and not, you can tell, me, tell folks why we want to alienate them. The opposition here is not like all Republicans or all white men or something like that or all conservatives. It's defined by people's core values. And we design it in each survey based on um, people's attitudes to a whole set of questions that we ask in the beginning of the survey. In the case of the economic survey, the opposition was about 10%, a little less actually, 10% uh, of the entire population. Now like Republicans would have been like 40%. So even a ton of Republicans, for example, are not in the opposition. Um, the opposition was defined in this case by people who uh, solidly do not want to roll for government. They want government staying out, solidly believe that the wealthy are there because they work harder than anybody else, solidly believe that we ought to believe in the free market. Um, a majority believe that working America, uh, that poor Americans do not work as hard as everyone else where uh, two-thirds of everyone else believes that working people, that poor people actually have fewer opportunities. It's not that they don't work harder. It's that they have fewer opportunities. So they have very, very distinctive values orientation represented by most commentators on Fox News. And um, that's who they are. And if, we were, if you think about these, these are people who don't believe in a role for government, believe the wealthy are there because they're superior, and think poor people don't work hard enough. Those aren't people we want to agree with us because think of how we would have to um, 
water down our message to get those people to agree with us. Also, if we think about uh, ourselves in a political debate, um, we want those people to stand for what they believe in because what they believe in is so distinctive from what um, the rest of America believes in, the majority of America, the, and including a, major, a solid majority of persuadables. So we want to isolate them. We want to alienate them because we want to reveal them and isolate their point of view, their values, which are not the values of most Americans. And let me turn it over to Anat to expound on linguistically why it doesn't work. Yeah. So first I actually would like to turn the question around and ask you all hypothetically, obviously, because you're on mute. Why wouldn't you want to alienate your opposition? They oppose you. And again, to underscore what Flinda said, we're not talking about all the Republicans in the sample. We're not talking about all the rich old white men in the sample. We're talking about a set of people who at their core don't agree with us. And so the reason that we want to alienate them is twofold. One, partly it's just an affect. It's accidental. When you say what you actually believe, crazy communist manifesto things, like Selinda showed us, like every working parent should get paid enough to set their kid off to a decent future, you alienate them. They don't like that. And so if you're not seeking to alienate them, then you wouldn't be allowed to say that. And I think that that's a pretty non-controversial thing to say. And the rest of the sample, you know, 90% of Americans are solidly in agreement with me that that is a non-controversial thing to say. That doesn't even register as a problem. So one of the reasons you want to alienate them is it's just a check. Not only are your messages persuasive, but are they actually progressive? And that brings me to the second reason. The second reason goes back to the thing that I said at the top of the call, which is that it's not the job of a good message to say what is popular. A thing that would not alienate the opposition, and I've personally never tested it, but I'm going to go out on a limb, or at some point I'm going to save my money, I'm going to get Celinda to test this for me, uh, free pie. Free pie, not going to alienate the opposition. Everyone's going to dial up. You're going to have a few gluten-free people who are upset, but you're going to have a pretty healthy, solid set of lines. Unfortunately, none of us are in the business of giving away pie, so knowing that free pie is a solid message that nobody runs away from is not that useful a thing to know. So the job of the message is not to say what is popular. The job of the message is to make popular what we need said. And if the message is rating is popular with people who fundamentally at their core, 10% of the population, that we could turn ourselves purple in the face and they will still never agree with us, they will never believe us, if they like what we're saying, then are we truly advancing our cause? Because the name of the game is to stake out our territory and to bring the persuadable to us. And the last thing that I'll say about this is that cognitively part of what's going on here is that as much as we think in polarities and we think, oh, well, there's the way that we think and we're progressive and there's the way that conservatives think and they're conservative and that's where the greatest differences lie, actually, in a, at a cognitive level, in many ways, the having a very, very strong, mostly immovable opinion, like I'm going to guess almost everyone on this call, um, who are unpersuadable toward our issues on our issues, um, the having a very, very strong opinion sits in one place and one sort of particular set of neural pathways that we actually share with these other people who are unpersuadable on their side. The different brain structure actually lies in people who are persuadable. And so the persuadable, because they don't have firm opinions, even at the values level of why are rich people rich? Why are poor people poor? What is the role of government? If we had the right policies in place, could we make it so that no one was poor in America? The people who aren't sure about these things in the way that we're absolutely sure and our opponents are absolutely sure, those people are looking for a leader. What they're looking for is this is the way the world works. And so we need our messages to not just be popular, we need them to be popular evocations of our worldview to actually bring people to our orientation of the facts. Thank you. So the next question is, uh, is this. Uh, there's been some research 
that's been floating around of late that suggests that talking about um, our economic agenda as a women's economic agenda in a, in a gendered way that frames it that way undermines support of it compared to framing it as a pro-family agenda. So I guess the question is, what are your thoughts about the balance between speaking to women specifically in our base about an, a, agenda items that may powerfully turn them out to vote or become um, uh, participants in the movement versus this family framing value which has performed well across the board basically every time we get out and do research. So let me, uh, I'll start with a little uh, of that and then um, glad, uh, and, and not we should compare. And, you know, this is something that would be good, honestly, to have additional research on. But there are a couple of things that we know. We know that, um, number one, that in terms of persuading people, uh, there is no contest in terms of which is more persuasive. The uh, family-based messaging is more persuasive than the gender-based messaging. Um, and we also know that um, real people don't give a damn who's in your family. They're worried enough about their family. Their family's changing composition all the time. Um, and, and there's really not a lot of second guessing about uh, who's in your family. There is some sensitivity among, um, we also know that 50% of America is unmarried now, and we know that um, in the 2016 election, it will be the first election where 50% of women will be unmarried. That said, unmarried women consider themselves to have um, families. <laughs> they didn't just pop, uh, you know, uh, it's not an accurate conception here. And they have responsibility and they have families and they're very, very supportive of the language. Um, what we do know is that women who have never had children are sometimes a little bit sensitive to talking about children and they like a little bit better next generation. But, um, you know, again, no sensitivity to talking about family. Everybody thinks they got a family. Nobody cares who's in your family except for right wingers who want to judge what's a family and what's not a family. Now, then you come to the issue of get out the vote. And there has been some work that has been done among younger millennials and among um, unmarried women that suggests that when we have been really, really explicit uh, in some gender messaging around equal pay, for example, equal pay couples with choice, and talk about it very much not in a family way but in a women's way, that that helps with GOTV. And we also know from some of the work that we've done around minimum wage that um, what uh, that some of the generic appeals are being less successful right now, and that um, for turnout, helping people see themselves get a personal gain in something helps with turnout. So, for example, we did work with young African American males, and we had the more generic, you know. Uh, minimum wage will help everybody, blah, 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 and this was just for turnout. This was not persuasion. And then we tested the message basically, you know, don't trust the man, go vote yourself a raise. And there was no contest, which was more likely to get them out to vote. It was don't trust the man, go vote yourself a raise. Um, so there's a little bit of tension in the GOTV world that's coming out of this instinct that uh, voters are having drop-off voters are having that nobody's ever talking to me and explicit things that will benefit me tend to motivate them to vote. But in general, I would say that um, for persuasion, for mobilizing mass numbers of people, the family-oriented message is better. Sometimes when you want someone to give a donation online or sign a petition or get out the vote, in some of those cases, the more explicitly group-oriented message uh, may work better. And I don't know if other thoughts to add to that. Yeah. I personally, very strongly, I'm sure no one on this call can tell that I feel very strongly about the things that I feel. I hate when things are framed as women's anything because women are the majority. <laughs> And 
we're not a special interest group. So this notion that there is a women's economic agenda that paid leave or paid sick days or child care are women's issues make me want to tear my hair out. And my response to all women's groups, and, and many of them are my clients, are please rename yourselves majority rules. Um, I would like men to start having a men's economic agenda because they are in fact the minority, especially when we're talking about voters. So I really, I find it troubling that we think of things as a women's economic agenda because we're actually just reinforcing the notion that, and let's face it, what are we talking about? We're talking about child rearing responsibilities. Um, and sometimes we're talking about pay equity, that's fine, we're talking about that too. But when we're talking about child rearing responsibilities or elder care and we call that a women's economic agenda, that is a reinstantiation of all of the things that we don't believe in, <laughs> which is that, you know, women by their very nature and biology are sort of more interested in and ought to be more responsible for these considerations, which is crazy making and part of the entire problem that we're facing. And the reason why all of these professions pay less, because they're devalued, because they're gendered. So, you know, partly it's what is working better, and this family comes first notion is working better, but it's also at a deep level, are we actually giving into a framework that is at odds with the change that we seek in the world? Is this really what we mean to be saying? Thank you. And let's stick with you, Anak, to answer this question, because I know you have done a lot of thinking and are doing research on it at this very moment. Uh, someone suggests that we need to really, really get out of using the language of worker and avoid calling people workers. Could you speak to, uh, I know you agree with that, but could you talk a little bit about what's happening when we use the word worker and what the research shows? Yeah, but can, I, can you tell me later who that person is so I can send them some sort of love letter? Um, so yes, whoever is saying that, I can't see who's asking the question, so I'm, I'm not just being silly. I really don't know. Um, using worker is a terrible thing to do. Um, what it does is it places humans into the worker frame. And in the worker frame, there are relatively few things. There are tasks, there are paychecks, there are coworkers, there are bosses, there are workplaces, and so on. What is not in a worker frame is things like babies and knee injuries and mothers that are ill and really life and, you know, head vi like viruses and ear infections and so on. All of those things are not in a worker frame. And what we know from experimental evidence, in fact, um, I will share with you that I'm in the midst of um, a research project right now with some social science colleagues, and we have brought people into a lab and we ask them to think of themselves as um, the managers of a business. And we give them facts about the business. This is how big it is. This is the profit share. This is the number of people. Uh, this is what you do. And we want you to consider a paid leave policy. And the only difference is that for half the people, we say, we want you to consider a paid leave policy for your workers. And for the other half, we say, we want you to consider a paid leave policy for the people who work for you. But otherwise, all the facts are the same. And then we ask them to think about it, and they come back with an answer. The people who are designing or considering paid leave for their quote unquote workers, about 50% of them issue a paid leave policy. 50% say nothing. The average leave granted is around two weeks, and the average wage replacement granted is around 50% of the person's salary. In the other condition, the paid leave consideration for the people who work for you, um, almost 90% of the people who work get leave. The wage replacement is almost complete and the average length of leave is around eight weeks. So the differences are really big. When we talk about people as workers, the set of issues that has to do with our lives as human beings gets eclipsed from view and it becomes very, very problematic and challenging to argue for these things. Um, what we're seeing in work that actually Celinda and I are doing separately, um, but building upon this work for CCC that we just shared uh, for the AFL-CIO, is that working people, um, 
one of Flinda's other colleagues, Joshua Ibarri, pointed out, and it's really bearing out in the data, that the danger of people who work is that it calls into mind, well, then there are people who don't work. And so the sort of best answer we're seeing, and we're seeing really strong quantitative response, both in terms of how people self-identify when you give them choices as to how they want to reference themselves vis-a-vis -vis work, um, working people is, is probably our best bet. And then uh, somebody asks right now about what about working families? Yeah. Um, so, Linda, do you want to take that? Do you want me to? You can. Um, working families tested really, really strongly um, in the label portion of our work um, in uh, this particular project. And I think, you know, clearly given how much strength we're seeing around family and around framing our demands as being about caring, the ability to care for family and, you know, the future of family and so on. Uh, my personal concern with working families is, you know, any notion of kind of work is, is metastasizing and it's become, I mean, it's not even becoming, it's become everything. Um, and we know this, of course, from the hyper sort of work environment that even kindergarten has become. As the mom of two young kids, um, I'm sure many of you share my concern of just kind of how much work is creeping into our lives and the lives even of our children. Um, that's my only sort of misgiving about working family, but, but the data supports it very strongly. The other thing I would say is, and, and all of us have this incredible need and demand for the label. What are we going to call people? What are we going to yeah. call people? Actually, what's testing better is, is not to call people anything. And, in fact, we're working together with a not on a project in Missouri where the Missourians just kept taking out the words we were using, the labels. Uh, what works really well is to describe people's common shared experiences, their lived experiences. So it works, honestly, a lot better to, rather than workers, not workers, working people, to say things like the people who are struggling to sustain their families, the people who are struggling to make ends meet, the people who are clocking in and producing all the products. I mean, invariably and without exception, the, condi the describing the actual experience is working so much better than the label. Now, I appreciate that it's hard because there's so much of our dialogue that is revolves around labels, but really, we would be a lot better off doing a lot less labeling and a lot more describing of the conditions. Because once you lay out those conditions, it triggers a whole set of shared values, a whole set of shared experiences, <coughs> and then you want to do something about those conditions you just described. Uh, yeah, if we're the ones who uh, are crocking in every day and yet can't get paid sick days uh, when our kids are sick, even though family comes first, you know, boy, you got everybody on board. Um, working people need paid sick days. That is just so much less emotional to people. So, uh, so Linda, let's stick with you for a second for this question. Uh, the question is, uh, what did our research show about cracking the code of people in terms of people's opposition to government or mm. people's opposition of trying to recast uh, uh, benefits and wages as public goods that the government should act on. And I know you have a lot of thoughts about the conventional wisdom on this, but can, so can you answer that and as what as to what our findings were? Sure. So there are a couple of things that we know. Uh, one thing that we know is that um, the conventional wisdom on the role of government is 100% wrong plus or minus 5%. So everyone says you can't mention government. God forbid you mention federal government. Uh, and yet, when we actually ask in core attitudes, um, you know, which comes closer to your view in terms of the role for government um, versus the free market or government versus government should, government should play a role versus government should uh, stay out of it, we won those comparisons uh, in terms of government should stay out and let the free market, first of all, the, it's not government that's in disrepute, but the free market is in disrepute. So we won, there is a, a role for government, and we put government up front. We listed it first, 
And we said, uh, government, we didn't use some kind of euphemism. And we won the debate about government should ensure that every person who wants to work has a job and a good standard of living versus the government should get out of the way and let the free market work. We won that 62-27. When we had just the very explicit role for government, we won it by 10 points. And the rising American electorate, or the new American majority, whichever you prefer to call it, is actually really loves the role of government. They are very pro the role of government. Um, in the policy agenda, which we didn't spend a lot of time on because we were spending time on messaging, in case after case after case, we used all the language that we're not supposed to be able to use. We call for a major government investment. We use the G word before we even got to what we're investing in. Um, we talked about uh, active role for government. We talked about expanding tax credits. We said have the government expand. Uh, we said raise the federal minimum wage. So across the board in the agenda, we very, very explicitly front-loaded government uh, uh, investments, uh, taxes, and even violating our own rule, which is, you know, do what you're doing first and then tell people how you get to it. And without exception, we won these policies overwhelmingly. We did alienate the opposition. But again, as we've talked about, we don't want them. Uh, so investing in rebuilding America, 92% of Democrats favored. That's 76% of independents favored it, even when it explicitly included clean energy, which is more controversial to people. Um, and when we talked about um, tax credits, 86% of Democrats, 73% of independents supported it. When we talked about have government expand childhood education, create jobs and raise wages, 87% of Democrats supported it, 80% of the rising American electorate, 68% of independents. Um, so we very, very explicitly used government. Um, and the thing that is really in disrepute, there is a great distrust of government, but that is rooted in two things. One, the belief that government doesn't get anything done. And two, anti-political feelings. What people are really anti right now, much more so than government, is politicians. And whether you're talking about regulation or you're talking about investment or you're talking about education, people across the board see a pretty major role for government. Great. Um, now let's move to Anat. Uh, a question from your presentation, Anat. You said that it's important to lead with a value proposition. And the question basically is, could you give a couple of examples of how that might work? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So uh, from another project, just to give you more of a flavor, um, an example would be a message that begins, the same is true today has been throughout history. People move to make life better for themselves and their families. That's a value proposition that then leads into an immigration message where the ask is about um, a roadmap to citizenship. Another would be uh, America is a nation of values rooted in an ideal that all people are equal. That would be a value proposition that would lead into a message that could be about criminal justice. It could be, again, about immigration. It could even be about economic inequality. Um, a value proposition in a message that you just heard um, from the more negative side, not the positive, would be like in out of balance. Um, America's economy has swung widely out of balance. Um, that's less a value proposition and more of sort of an assertion of the current state of things. So what I mean by a value proposition, and thanks for the question, I could totally see how that is sort of ambiguous, but it's this is the way the world is supposed to work. It's basically a way of stating this is what we believe in, this is the way the world is supposed to work, and then you go from there to arguing why your set of solutions um, are the right way to get to that proposition. So, you know, it's just in some ways sort of basic sales, right? Just as you don't walk into an Apple store and have them be like, look at the price, see the price, look at the price, or necessarily be like the processing speed is the 6.25 gigabit, you know, you can see how much I know about this. Um, I should probably use an example that I actually know something about. 
those details are there, and they're there for the people who desire to know about them. The price is there for the people who, you know, all people desire to know about that. But the first thing they're selling you on is what is it that you're going to be able to do? What deep human need and desire is this about to fulfill for you? Great. Now, this is a very good question, um, and I don't know which one of you wants to take this one, uh, because if you can answer it, uh, uh, here, here's the question. Uh, in some of our messages, we're talking about how people create wealth, or we create wealth together. The question is, a number of people in our base don't actually believe that, and I know Celinda and Anadi in our own focus groups and listening sessions, we sometimes ran into this reality. Um, and the question is, what do we do with that? Do we need to persuade them that whatever their job is, they are creating wealth? Or is that something we need to go around and talk about regardless of what you create as a human being you deserve to be able to raise and sustain your family? Well, Anat, do you want to start? Yeah. So it's an excellent question, as Jeff said. First, let me back up around the proposition and say, actually, I'm shocked the degree to which people actually do believe it. I'm not discounting your observation by any means. I, I would be crazy to. There are people who don't believe it. But in the AFL work that I referenced before, we have a question in which um, we purposely didn't rotate the answers. And the question was, where do jobs come from? And we gave a series of very you know, conventional answers. It comes from business leaders making good decisions and good choices. It comes from wealthy people who put forth capital to grow businesses. It comes from entrepreneurs who have a great idea and launch a new venture. It comes from government directly investing. And then we held back as the final answer. It comes from working people who you know, produce and consume and save and invest. And so you heard all of those choices first, and we held, quote unquote, our answer for last. And almost everyone in the sample, except for our opposition, actually overwhelmingly waited through all those answers and chose working people. So first of all, I just want to say that numerically, statistically, actually way more people seem to understand it than I would have guessed. I was surprised at the strength um, of that answer. But that said, there are people who don't believe it. In general, not just in this question, but whatever is sort of most core to your proposition, you actually need to be the most careful about directly asserting. And the reason that you need to be most careful about directly asserting it is because assertions are heard in the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that's latest to develop from uh, adolescence and into adulthood. It's the part that's responsible for higher order reasoning. Do I agree? Do I disagree? What's her evidence? You know, where does she come from? What have I heard that's different than that? So again, going back to a different example, in the immigration debate, there's a lot of disbelief that immigrants pay taxes. Obviously, immigrants pay taxes. We have epic amounts of evidence. And in fact, they pay taxes incommensurate to the services that they receive because they pay more. We all know that. If that becomes actually a stated fact, then it just causes people to go into contention mode. So instead of saying in that debate, immigrants do pay taxes, which of course is true, because we need people to understand that, we say instead, immigrants contribute to our culture and community and we're all the better for having them here. So if there's really a sticking point around a thing like, you know, working people are who create jobs or working people are where money comes from in America, we actually want to be careful about not directly asserting that in a space where that feels untrue or contentious. We want to say things like, every day across America, you know, ordinary people, just like you and me, are out doing our business. We're shopping in stores. We're going on roads. We're dropping our kids off at school. We're headed to the dentist, hoping not to find a cavity. All of these things are economic actions. All of these, three, all of these things cycle money through our economy, making it change from hand to hand to hand. You know what I'm saying? So you don't assert it. You just sort of paint the picture of it happening. 
The other uh, couple of things I would say is, one, I would just underscore what Anat said. In the focus groups, when we asked people where does wealth come from, it was remarkable how many people thought a, a major contribution is from the people who work. Um, what people were, uh, where we got a little bit of a rub with some men, some um, more Republican types, was the um, a credit that they wanted to give the entrepreneur. Um, so all of us working on this together, we create the wealth, but somebody put up the money, somebody had the good idea, and it was really more the idea and the risk than actually the wealth. Uh, that wasn't what people were focused on. It was the idea that somebody took a risk here, somebody came up with this great idea, and they should be compensated more. And that's the American way. And if you're willing to go out and take a risk, and we believe in these risk takers, and you can go bankrupt in this country and then go take another risk. And, but that's a brave and courageous thing to do, but it's also an all-American thing to do. So um, that's why I was really wanted to show you the community message, because we found a way to be in keeping with our agenda and our values, but still bring in the entrepreneur. So I think much of the way around this, um, some of this tension that you may be feeling is if we can bring an entrepreneur into our messages. And I would also just add that that's important full stop. It's extra super emphatically important when we're talking to and about Latinos. Uh, Latinos yeah, open and operate more small businesses than any other racial ethnic group in the United States. And any kind of blanket assumption that uh, we just have Latinos as Democrats or as progressives is false. I think you guys probably already know that. And the place that we really, really fall down on our Latino message is around this value of go get them and entrepreneurship and starting small businesses and doing for yourself. So we need to really be aware of that and be mindful that that is an incredibly powerful and motivating force. And um, what we find is that when we remind people that you know, reaching for the stars requires standing on a firm foundation, that there's no opportunity in entrepreneurship if you're paycheck to paycheck, then people both are like, yes, I value entrepreneurship, and yes, I get how these kinds of completely immiserating conditions stifle entrepreneurship, which is a thing that I'm excited about. So we've reached the end of our time. Um, I just want to uh, let people know a few things. First of all, there were many, many good questions. So thank you to each and every one of you who attended. These are amazing questions. We will get back to each of the questions. We have a full file, and one way or another you will hear from um, us uh, to do our best to answer your question. If you have additional questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, our email address is in the uh, materials that we sent to you. Um, and we will get we will get back to you. I am also very happy to arrange um, additional briefings. If you have staff, stakeholders, members you'd like to dig in to uh, this research more with, I'm happy to talk with you and figure out how we can best do that together. Um, we will be posting a recording of the webinar so that you can share it with um, whom you uh, like uh, as soon as possible after downloading this. It will go out in an email to the RSVP list, and as well, we'll be posting it on the website. And I guess the last thing just to say is I want to thank uh, Celinda and Anant. You two are both rock stars. It's amazing to uh, work with you all. And thanks to everyone, and have a great weekend. Thank, thank you. you.